Yes. Great. Hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks once again for coming for the PHP meetup. Um, so today my talk will be about how to refactor like a boss. So how many of you were actually here for my last presentation? Um, quite a few. No, over there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So in my, in, I'll just do a quick recap from part one, all the things that well, I kind of covered. Um, so let's see how, how, how that goes. Um, so question is why, is, why is refactoring? Why do we do it, right? So my hypothesis is that software left alone will decay. So if you don't touch your software, after a while, you'll just get, get stale and be, it become irrelevant. Uh, so you need to change it. So a change made to the internal structure uh, so basically, what is refactoring? Refactoring is a change made to the internal structure of the software that makes it easier to understand, cheaper to make future changes, and it also does not change the observable behavior of the software. So when you refactor a code, you should still perform the same way as it should. If you have test coverage that helps you understand uh, that you have actually made some change that changes behavior, uh, that would be good. If you don't have tests, then you got to have some QA guy who go through the do some re, re, uh, regressive regression testing and all that, which is quite stressful. Um, so basically, refactoring a code shouldn't make any change to the behavior of, or to the behavior of a software. And overall, we should overall it should improve the design of the code. Basically, it should improve the design and readability and how well it can be maintained in the future. Basically, the two important things are easy to understand. Make your refactoring makes your code easier to understand, and also make it cheaper to make changes. So this is how you can justify to your boss that you're spending time refactoring. I make I'm making it cheaper to make changes in the future. Okay, that's how you justify to your boss when you say when you're spending time doing this. Now, of course, having help tests does help you ensure that you didn't change your behavior, right? So which is why test driven development is important and I think you should be, become, try and make it a, a, a habit to write tests before you write code. It's hard, I know, but you know, I'll, I'll show you some techniques later. So some of the common refactoring techniques I covered, uh, I covered some of this in the last, uh, last talk. So basically, first of all, is how change your names to communicate intent. Because foo and ba doesn't actually communicate intent, right? It should be like first name, last name or something like that. And lead, take away all the magic numbers, so you have things like um, exchange rate and all that stuff in magic numbers somewhere. You will put it to pass it to a variable and say that put a variable name that gives it intent. It helps you understand what it is. Um, and you try to keep one responsibility per function. Basically, your your function should try to be as small and lean as possible, and only does one thing at a time. Right. So in the last session, uh, I actually went through quite a lengthy discussion on how to, you should how you can refactor a very simple test code. So today I'll be touching on the last, last point, which is do not be obsessed with primitives, right? Primitives are, what are primitives? Primitives are basically, you know, associative arrays, arrays that you pass into your code, right? So why is associative arrays and arrays are awesome um, as a generic data container? So basically, you passes it you put you just it's the best it's a generic uh, container for all sorts of data of, of information information about what's in the shopping cart information about what's in uh, you know uh, how much you've spent on something or how much is this user buying from your website it can be very awesome for just storing all sorts of generic data but they do not communicate intent. Right, unless you have associative, but then because you have you can have associative arrays if you have name, but then you can't be sure that the name will always be there. You can't be sure that the associative array will always be have the have, uh, right. So why if you have to make changes in the future? So you make if you make changes in the future, if your associative array doesn't, uh, for example, your associative array, you change the payload uh, and you change the <coughs> name of the key, right? Um, and you do have tests that covers you. It makes it very hard to basically makes your, your your API very brittle, right? So basically, try not to be obsessed with just passing arrays or associative arrays around. So in the alternative to to doing this is to basically use classes and models. So in the last talk, there was a talk about ORMs. So ORMs is actually a very good way of abstracting away uh, behaviors, right? Um, and, and simple classes is also good good for encapsulating. 
uh, behavior. So what you want is to have behaviors um, communicated through a class, rather than having you do sorts of all sorts of funny things. The second point would be switch to a compositional approach. Basically, you compose and create classes to that that can mix and match together. Having classes that that has each class having its own in, uh, ex explicit behavior and other classes having an explicit behavior, when you put them together, they can have new interactions. When in individual objects that has individual its own um, way of behaving, when you mix them together in, in a, in a diff novel, different way, you can then have new ways of using them. Um, always use, so use objects that work together. So basically, yeah, what I said earlier about com composi compositional approach. Um, so in the last example, we have a last last week's uh, last month's example. We talk about a club membership register. So, just to recap to you, maybe I'll show you how it looks like. Um, <coughs> uh, wrong one. Uh, the other one. Yes. So this is right. So. The membership register will basically is a CSV file, a CSV file which is where you where you pull uh, your membership record, and then you have a way of uh, adding new members. And in the last in last week's uh, last month's refactoring, we actually uh, broke a one single fu uh, f function, in which was something like this. This is the original function, which has basically things like add member, uh, which is an add member function, and then we broke it down into four different, three different functions, which has each, each, each of the function having an explicit uh, behavior. Right, so we, has, we have one method that tells us, that gets the member, and ask, then the second method asks me, is this member in the list? And it adds it to the file, and then the actual function that actually gets implemented. Or rather, the one, the function that gets used. And the API is actually quite straightforward, um, if I can scroll down to the bottom. So to use this is basically just a matter of passing in a, 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 an array, an array of names, which will basically because and then the data will be mapped to a CSV file. So I felt easy, the fastest and easiest way to implement this is just pass in an array, which then get used and inserted into a CSV file. So this is the first implementation which we cover in refactored. So this the API is very straightforward. It's just passing first name, last name, and email because that's how the CSV file is kind of structured, right? So that's the first first bit. So yeah, so. So, so this array I pass in, add member, blah, blah, blah. You check for duplicates, duplicate email. You, you, you would not insert if there's already in there. Yeah, so basically some simple, simple, simple checking. And then the actual act of inserting into the, into the file is, is also handled by a separate function, right? So you have done that, and your, your boss and, or manager is happy. But your manager comes to you again, rubbing his hand and saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking of adding a new field. <laughs> To the CSV file, right? To this, to this register, I'm getting confirmation from directors. But in any case, you want to make sure that the script can support, say, an address field, right? For example, so we have first name, last name, email, and now we want an address field, which means a fourth column in the CSV file. Okay. So assuming we cannot move away from CSV, we gotta stay with the CSV. So what should we do, right? Um, so how do we do this? Well, a simple approach would be. To say, uh, you know, just add a new item to the array, lah, right? So we have uh, with the the input array that I showed you earlier on, which has only, which has three things: first name, last name, and email, right? So let's maybe add a, a fourth item, lah, You know, like first name, last name, email, and then put the address. Assuming the fourth column will be the address field, right? So use the same method that you should solve the problem, right? But what if? What if the boss becomes so enthusiastic and say, look, I also want to capture the phone number or maybe some other information about how much they're earning and stuff like that. So what if this happens in the future, what do we need to do? If you follow the same method of doing this, it means you have to keep growing the array. The array has to keep growing and growing and growing, which can become a little bit crazy. So what if they also decide to change the order of the fields, say, oh, maybe uh, email is more important because you want to make sure the email is the real, true, primary key. And they want to change the order of the input field, which makes it crazy, right? That means, oh no, then all my code will be broken because I expect the first column to be first name, right? Do you kind of get this kind of uh, re request at work? You do, right? Okay, never mind. <laughs> That's not good. Okay, 
So yeah, we panic and say, no, maybe this is not the right approach to solve this problem, right? So what we want to do is take in terms of business logic. What do we want to do? So instead of modeling a new member as an array, let's imagine it as an object. As an object with attributes and behaviors. So basically, OOP, la, to use the OOP approach, we model it as an as object. So how do we convert a procedural code, which I have shown you, uh, into a object oriented code? A uh, simple way of doing this in, 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 this, in the industry, at least what I've tried and successfully used, is this thing called CRC, uh, Class, Responsibility and Collaborators. How many of you have heard of this term, CRC? No? Okay. Well, it's basically, it's about going to the drawing board and drawing, drawing a little card like this and say, this is a class name, this is what a class knows and what it should be doing, and these are the collaborators the people and other classes that you actually work with. So basically what this class knows and what, what this class is responsible for, you write it down on the left column, and the collaborators, who, what you actually have to work with, yeah, you have to instantiate or work with or you have to rely on, for example. And these are your collaborators. Who are these other classes that you work with? So one way of modeling this is looking at, so we're dealing with a membership registry, right? So I think the first obvious class we have is a member class, right? So what does, what does member know? What does a member class know? What is it responsible for? You know, the member class knows about the first name, the last name, the particulars of the member, right? This is the first thing that we know. So it knows about, about membership, uh, about the member's particulars. So we also want to know about so this is a club membership, right? So it probably has a club membership register, which is kind of like a, some, some container that will have a list of members. Uh, this container also knows who are the current members because based on our, the use case of our application is that if I add, some, uh, if I add a new record, you must make sure that I don't uh, add a duplicate person, for example. So you need to know who are the current members. Then you can also add a member you also probably need to, be, as it is now, the function kind of does insertion in the database, you know, inserts the item in the record, and writes new members to CSV file, and the collaborator that this membership register work with, the collaborators, is basically the members, right? You, so you basically, the, the member class has its own responsibility, the membership register class has its responsibility, but it also works with members because it relies on uh, how does it know that this person is already in the database? By checking the particulars of this member class, right? This member particular. So we look, take a step back. This seems to be a fairly straightforward implementation, but wait. Do you, do you get a sense that the membership class is actually doing too much, right? It's, it's actually, you know, it seems to know a bit too much about how we store the data. Right. Our previous implementation had functions that was broken down into different things and maybe we should try and abstract that behavior away because we seem to be, in, so the insertion of the stuff in the database should probably be a separate class. So this is how we restructure it. So we have, still have a member class, we still have a membership register but it knows less things now. So the, the club membership only knows about the list of members, who are the current members and how to add a member. And then as the, it collaborates with the members class, it also collaborates with a data store class, which we'll, cre which we'll create later. The data store class will be, could be your ORM or some database connections that you have, right? So this, this database, this data store class could be abstracted away. And the data store has only two responsibilities. Its only responsibility is to read the CSV file and to write to it, right? Straightforward, right? So three different classes with three distinct sets of responsibilities and, and they are, you know from this diagram that who are the collaborators it could possibly work with. Because the membership, the membership register is basically the center of the application. It collaborates with the member class to find out who, who are the names. <coughs> and also use the data store uh, class to basically read and write to the file, right? So these are the collaborators that uh, membership register works with. Of course, you could also go back and do some bit more thinking about how this works and maybe re refactor it a bit, but let's work with this for now, okay? 
So based on your procedural code that you have, you draw out CRC cards, you kind of figure out what are the collaborators, what are the responsibilities of each class. So this helps you in, 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 in clarifying, of, uh, in getting some clarity about what your models should look like and how, your, how you should model it and all your classes, what it should be doing. Right. So from the previous one, we looked at it has a smell. It, it, the, that, that class has too much responsibility, which is very good for you. Can sense the same sense, the tingle in your spi spidey nerves or whatever you know, spidey senses. That is bad. Is bad. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So we have this thing. So how we form that that little, small little diagram? We kind of like translate into a kind of like a model structure or rather a class structure. So we have a class, which is a member. It has probably knows about the, part the particulars. So in our current existence, so what is, the what is the rule of refactoring? Refactoring shouldn't change the behavior of the code, right? So based on what is our code actually doing now, mm -hmm. let's refactor it and make it reflect that, that behavior. In our database and CSV file right now, we only store the first name, last name, and email. Address is possibly in the future, but it has not been confirmed yet, right? So we take the, our current existing behavior, First name, last name, email. Make put them as public <coughs> attributes. And then we have data store, which basically has a, has basically a read all function, and an append function, which basically appends the data into the into the disk, uh, into the CSV file. And th and then this the, the the heart of our application, which is basically the one we will eventually use is say it's just add member, and add member will collaborate with is is in register. And all members basically will pull all the members and check whether it's in the register, right? So understand so far? Are you with me so far? Cool, right? So let's write some tests. <laughs> so uh, I believe in test-driven development, um, like a religion. <laughs> so basically, you use tests to guide your development features. So basically, how you uh, the features that you're going to write, you use tests to kind of guide you along, right? I, I see it as a kind of like a way of discovering uh, how, you, how you should write your classes. So tests are important in ensuring that your code changes and does not affect existing behavior of your, of your code. So basically, you want to make sure that your, your tests will help you in the future. Um, that it will not, uh, when you make changes in the future, you will not uh, break anything. And the way we do TDD is basically we write a test uh, which doesn't have any code implemented yet, which will basically fail. We call that a failing test. Then we write the test that kind of makes it work, the minimum amount of code, right, to make, it, make the test go green, from red to green. Uh, and then we go in and make the code more awesome. Basically, we do a bit more refactoring, reduce, uh, re uh, stop repeating ourselves, take out redundant code, so maybe reimagine how we, uh, yeah. So basically, refactoring is the last bit. Make it green and then make it clean. <coughs> so we write a test. So I use PHP unit. How many of you here use PHP unit? No, yes. Awesome. Great. Okay. So PHP unit is basically it's like it's a class of its own. You're right. You're using classes to write to write other classes, which is classception. Never mind. <laughs> so first you have a, we will test the constructor of the of for example this test over here, we're testing the constructor of the member class. We're passing in some these are the certain values that we want, and this is what we are passing in to say an imaginary member class. We have not created a member class yet. So we have just written a structure of how you should look like. So assuming your class looks like this right now, and you apply this test, you apply this behavior. My behavior is when I pass in an array of, uh, an associative array of first name, last name, and email, to, to members as part of the constructor. The resulting member class should have uh, first name set as the first name, last name set as the last name, and email set as the email, right? So mind you, I have not written a single line of, uh, of, of implementation code yet, right? It's just public uh, accesses. So we have public, we have public uh, first name, public, last name. So these are three attributes here. When you apply this test, when you run this test, what do you think would happen? We don't have a constructor yet. So the constructor doesn't know what, it, what to expect. And what would happen in your first run of the test? Yep, it failed because 
It doesn't know who you didn't somehow the first name was not set. So this is the first first sign of red. So do not be afraid to see red because it's a sign that you're doing something right. <laughs> or wrong. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> So basically, you look at the error messages. What is this telling you? It's telling you that oh, this, you're expecting Michael, but Michael is not there. Right? What's going on? Okay. So, so this is the right feeling. This is the right feeling test. So when you've done test test driven development for a while, that you sh you would kind of have a sense of what are the right type of feeling test and what are the wrong type of feeling test. If the right type of feeling test would be, I expect this to happen, and it's really not hap it's really not happening, right? A wrong type of feeling test would be a, it, it failed for an unexpected reason. Right? For example, you it couldn't for example, I cannot find the member class. What does that tell you? Well, if the error message says I cannot find uh, me member class is, is unknown or not found, what does that tell you? You're probably not including it or requiring the the member members.php in, uh, in, in your test in your test suite. Right, so that's a wrong type of feeling test. The right type of feeling test is when I, I this something like this. Right, I expect to find the first name, and the first name is not there. So let's go implement the code. I write a minimum amount of code, and say, look, this is the first name. So I expect that the API that I'm expecting is I'm, you, I'm I'm expecting an associative array. The associative array has first name, last name, and email, and I will set it accordingly. Uh, I'll set the Attributes accordingly, right? So this is pretty much a very simple implementation, and of course the the, part, the test is passing right now. So let's take another look at the code again, right? How do you think this code can be made better? How do you think this code can be made better? Can you see? Can right? Can't figure out. Okay. <clears throat> Don't you think it's a bit cumbersome to always set the field name explicitly? Do you find it kind of weird that if, like, say, I have to add uh, address or I have to add gender or something, it means this. Constructor could grow, right? This constructor will grow quite explicitly. Um, so it might be a bit strange to do it. I mean, it might be, it might not be able to, to uh, survive too much changes in the future, right? So let's try and make it such that we only, we, if there's a new field, we only, uh, we only make the change to one line of code rather than seven lines or eight lines of code based on, the, you know, yeah. So how do we do this? Okay, so a simple loop, like say we know that it's going to be an array, associative array. We can do a for each loop, and then we have a say a static method which kind of declares the known the known fields. These are the known fields that we kind of will have in this class, and then we kind of set it explicitly, right, with a variable variable. <laughs> huh? Well. If, assuming I have no option to use ORM, but an ORM will actually have this discovered for me. But you know, but, but let's, let's let's put that aside and just deal with just <laughs> simple plain old PHP classes, right? How will we do this? So this is how I would have done it, right? So I have an explicit list of known uh, known known columns, uh, known fields that you will will have. So in the future, if we add an address or phone number. Where will we change? We just need to change this one line of code, right? Of course, to make it more readable, we want to make it multi-line. I can, you know, kind of like, you know, yeah, so. But, but still, just one point of one point of change, right? So it's how you can make your ch future changes cheap, or rather, make your ch uh, future changes not so expensive, right? Because, yeah. And then how do you? Okay, so let's look at let's look at reverse. Look, say if I add a new field, uh, say address, how will our test be? Amended to reflect this. Hmm? 
Mm, yeah, it's a test again. So how would this test be, be amended to reflect the new field? Well, it's simply just a matter of adding another assertion at the bottom, right? Right. Well, this could also, also, could also be refactored, right? We're not just refactoring tests or uh, code, we also can refactor tests, right? The same method that we have, we have used to put a static method with an array of known fields, we can also do a, something similar, right? So basically, based on what you expect to be known in the to, to be known to the class, I can actually use that and loop through that. I can use the same static method, loop through it, and look at this. So basically, I want I will use the test, the the codes, the, the members own. I could basically use this guy. Where is it? Uh, I, I instead of turning this into a private method, it could be a public method. If it's a public static, I can actually access it outside of the class which means I can use it in the test. So the test can then use this field to loop through to check itself, right? So that's one way of making your test a little bit more, a little bit more ex, uh, future-proof, extendable, right? So that's one uh, way. Of course, there could also be a clever alternative. So uh, we could use some very nice PHP functions such as array walk. This is a very interesting function. If, uh, if you know PHP has a lot of like array manipulation, you know, stuff. So you can do like array walk, find the known fields, and you have you pass in a uh, you use functional programming to kind of like pass in something and then inject it into this guy. Da, da, da. It's very clever code, lah, um, but it's definitely not readable, <laughs> right? You will find your your most smartest engineer in your team doing something like this. Just smack him in the head, right? This is totally unreadable. What the f what the hell are you trying to do, right? So, um, so there is a there's a limit to how you should refactor. All right, you should you should refactor in a way that it makes it easy to make changes, but not in, up to a point where it makes it impossible to understand, right? That only you understand it. That's wrong. Okay, so that's um, yeah. So so a clever alternative like this wouldn't make sense. So after some time, you basically you know, rinse and repeat all the, all the simple, all the tests. So after some time working through all the different classes, this is kind of like the final implementation. So the member, it's, the member itself, uh, again, has the known fields, it has the same thing. I also initialize a member. Basically, I want to have a way of initializing a, a record easily. So basically, I pass in, uh, <coughs> I pass in a record or array of, of sorts and it construct um, the member and returns a new member. So it's kind of like a, a, factory, a factory method of sorts. Uh. Okay. You understand why I need this in, uh, going further down. <coughs> I also implement a little function called equals. So basically from based on uh, this, from your object comparing with another object, is that the same guy, right? Something like that. So it has some form of deep, uh, equivalent checks inside his web. So if you remember from the last uh, month's example, you first of all check whether the email is the same and also check whether the first name, last name is the same. So this is uh, following the same uh, use usage that we had in the last month's uh, example. <coughs> and then we have another method called values, which will basically be used uh, to kind of derive and get all the public attributes that can then insert into uh, a CSV file. <coughs> <coughs> so a CSV data store. So we have a, well, in my earlier example, we, I talked about a CS, uh, uh, data store, right? Uh, rather in the f earlier CRC cards, we talked about a data store. Well, maybe we should name the thing a bit more appropriately, right? Naming a, fun naming a class uh, with the right names also uh, <coughs> communicates meaning. Data store doesn't tell you what kind of, what kind of data base is using, right? So CSV data store is a way of communicating intent. Basically, the this class is meant to be storing the CSV files. So basically, it's a matter of just creating a, a CSV a CSV file uh, pointer and then uh, passing in the file handle and um, this is actually all oh right. Sorry, this is actually deriving the name. So in our earlier example, in the last month's example, the file name is actually hard-coded into the function, right? which can be a little bit 
un, unextendable. Basically, in the, <coughs> in the future, if you, if you change the file name, then you have to make a lot of changes in the code. But if you can make it part of, as part of the constructor and say, I want to make, I only read from this file name or that file name. So you could have, you could create like, I don't know, um, Files based on alphabets. Uh, all the A's will go into a, into a file. All the B's go to a B file or something like that. So you can actually change the file name if you want to, right? Otherwise, you use the default default value, which in this case is just member CSV, and then basically creates a a, 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 a file handle, which is a, a instance attribute, which you can then use anywhere in your class. So this is where it reads all. It uses the same file handle. It rewinds it to the top loops through it and checks and then returns the data. So basically, I found that in, uh, in an earlier test that whenever I do a insert, it will put the pointer at the, at the very end of the file, right? So we need to probably do a rewind to move the pointer back to the, to the, back, back to the first record. You will discover this in testing, uh, <laughs> right? You'll find uh, behaviors like this that happen, so yeah. So it has its own, its own uh, attribute, or rather uh, an array, you do an array push to push it to the data, and then just return the data. So it's just returning arrays, right, at this moment. Um, and then here's the heart of the application. So the application, first of all, it takes in a data store. So this is what I'm talking about, a compositional approach. You have in your, the creation of your class, you also, you also inject a dependency. You're telling it, look, you shall depend on a data store. And this data store will implement certain API, certain, have a certain, predictable behavior. Your data store has a find all and then a pen, and maybe a delete in the future, for example. So you could easily switch out this object with, say, a MySQL data store, right? Which, which implements the same uh, APIs, find all, uh, you know, append to the database, which is just an insert, and delete, which could be just a remove, right? Or just, uh, just uh, um, delete from database, for example. So this is a compositional approach where I would basically um, pass in an object, and this helps you in testing. When you're writing a test, sometimes you want to re minimize your connections to the database, so you can actually pass in a mock object. A mock object which expects certain APIs to be called, right? Which means you don't need, actually need to make a call to the database. Uh, but as long as you call it with the right APIs and the right attributes, it returns a certain value which you can then expect. Right. But in this case, I'm also setting a default value. Say, if you don't pass in a data store, I'll, I'll just assume that you're using a CSV data store and then just instantiate that. Right. So this is a very good way of injecting dependency but also having a way of having a fallback in case nothing works. All members basically just uh, goes through and reads all the data from the, the from the CSV file. So it, from here it gets all the records. See here it is collaborating with data store, reads all, which is a method all found on the data store, gives all the records as a as an uh, array. And what I do next is that I'll, I'll call this method called init member. So what is the clever thing over here is that I'm passing in the record, which is a a, a full array, into uh, and I'm calling init member on every single object inside the array, right? So this gives me an array of like say five or five items. Array map basically what it does you basically on every item on every item inside all array you call this you pass this you call this method and pass in an object, right? Which is a clever way of like creating a uh, instead of getting an array of arrays. <laughs> You're getting an array of associative arrays. You're getting a array of objects. Isn't it clever? Okay, fine. <laughs> I write I write clever codes and never mind. Okay. Um, and then the question is: Is it in the array? Is it in the registry? So basically, ask itself: Is it, are you are you in the are you in the registry? We should call the equal method, which I talked about earlier. So based on all the members that that you have passed in, or rather, these are all the members I know of. Uh, is this member they are querying inside the list, right? So basically, as simple as that. Um, and next would be basically the actual, uh, the actual method that gets called to inject or to insert a new uh, member to the database, right? So here we are calling, I believe we are calling, 
get values? Are we using get values? Mm, never mind. Yeah, so basically, new member dot values. This will actually give me an array, array of all the items that I expect, and then uh, append it to the database, and then returns true. And then the remember we are not changing behavior of our code. So the code, the, the original code that you that we that we have is basically a plain old function. Right? We don't want to change that code too drastically, not yet at least. So we want to still keep that original function and original API. But what we're doing instead is we are you surrounding that procedural code with object-oriented code. Right? So basically over here, for example, we are creating a a new instance of uh, club membership, and I'm passing. I'm getting it in the add member function, which will then call. Uh, but first, you initialize the member, and you add, and you basically try to add the member to the list. So the same behavior that we had before, no changes to the behavior, right? Which means this method remains the same until you have an opportunity to refactor your or change this actual implementation right into from a procedural kind of thing to the object oriented kind of thing. So yeah. So basically this is how you can make your object oriented code collaborate with your procedural code. Yeah. So yeah. So when you're moving away from procedural code or uh, um, this this hopefully a suggested way you can learn. So a cleaner approach would have been to revise the app member uh, function altogether. So we say instead of using the function here, let's change the API altogether. The API shouldn't be using this anymore. It should just be called using objects directly. Right? So this is if you have the opportunity to change the implementation. But if you don't, then the previous example would be like it would be a good way to, to move forward. So possibly when your manager confirms the change, then you can actually change this code and whatever. Yeah. Um, any questions so far? Any questions so far? Are you? Are my examples clear? Need some feedback. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So what have we learned so far? Um, so we basically use CRC cards to identify boundaries around domains, entities, and models. Right. So we we use CRC cards to discover what are the responsibilities that these objects should have, and who are the people, who are the other classes that it collaborates with. This helps you to slim, uh, make your make your classes slimmer and leaner. Basically, they only be doing one thing, uh, your and your methods also be doing logical things that only associate with the class. Um, we also use test driven development to guide you. So basically, a good way a good way of thinking about it is that um, a test is kind of like how in an ideal world I would like to interact. A test is kind of like in an ideal world how I would like to interact with this object, right? In an ideal situation, I, I would want this to receive first name, last name, and something else, right? And it has to be reasonable. So having a test helps you to uh, imagine in your, in your ideal world situation how I want my models and objects to work, right? So basically, what you're thinking will be, if I pass this code on to someone else and he reads this test, you should also have the same, aha, I now I know how this object works. Because your test will be able to expose those behaviors. Right? So a test driven development, uh, TDD is a uh, writing test first is a good way of kind of like helping you define before you write the code, before you write a single line of code, help you define for yourself in an ideal world, how will I write this code? How will I want my fellow colleagues to write this code that I can understand, right? So basically, a test also ensures that your changes, uh, your change, be your changes doesn't uh, affect behaviors of your code. And of course, having tests also helps you ensure that you don't introduce tests, uh, introduce bugs rather. <laughs> test writing tests. And also, what I found is that writing having tests actually make gives you more confident in, in refactoring code. Just imagine that little piece of, of, of code that, I, that was written earlier on. Um, I don't know whether I can actually find it. Um, that little piece of code where the first implementation of, uh, of the constructor, for example. The first implementation of the constructor makes, I just, in, basically I'm setting your first name, last name, blah, blah, blah. 
without tests, how would you, how confident are you in making that change, right? Having a test helps you ensure that you, you can confidently make those changes that you want and not having to worry about, uh, am I introducing a bug? Because your test will help you cover that, right? The test will basically save your ass, <laughs> right? In, 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 yeah, so I found even in, right now I'm doing uh, Ruby, um, professionally, it's like having tests just gives you a lot more confidence in refactoring stuff that you know that you won't break anything, right? So one last caveat is only introduce backward incompatible API only as a last resort because you know that going forward, if you know going forward that this particular way of doing things is bad for your the health of your code and you should change the behavior altogether like the example that I gave about how app member is still a procedural function let's change it into an object oriented way of doing things right you know going forward like f three months down the road you basically reap the results reap the rewards of, of doing that kind of refactor then go ahead and do it right um, but only introduce that as a last resort for example app yeah uh, replacing app member procedural function with a cleaner implementation, which is full OO, right? For example, that's all I have, and you can find the code here. I have the full examples that um, that that, I have, that I've shared with you today, so you can see the test as well. The code that I have is fully tested. Um, I hope it's fully tested. <laughs> you can find <laughs> something is not tested. Send a pull request, <laughs> right? So yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Yep. Um, for DDD, uh, with your project, normally you will write test for every class or just some important classes? Um, I think if you have the luxury of time, you should yeah. test everything. Okay. If you don't have the luxury <coughs> of time, I think we call some, we, have, we write, I write tests for models mostly okay. because mo the mod models are where you have your business logic. And those things cannot fail. <coughs> those things cannot break. Yeah. So that's the most critical bits of your of your code. We also write tests for critical path, mm -hmm. like say interaction with your application, like say uh, to add something to cart, check out, make payment. Mm -hmm. The critical paths of your application, these are the paths you need to that you know that your business cannot do without. Mm -hmm. Those are critical paths that you also need to test. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Everyone to a situation where you, you, you take over some, somebody else's project. So what that is, there's 100 plus plant PHP files. It's very, very messy code. So uh, what was your decision? Normally you that you do refactoring or just continue the spaghetti code, but you still have the time constraint. I think personally, I will only go okay. If you get a legacy code base that you need to work with, I what I did previously was if I'm going to introduce new features, uh, and uh, and those new features also touch older code. I'll take the opportunity to write tests for the older stuff, right? I'll write some simple tests to cover the older, older stuff, and then I also write tests for the new stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm writing that will cover. Both the things. So slowly, as you as you build your application or add new features, your new features, no doubt, somehow or other, will have touched up old code. So you take the opportunity to write small tests to check the old code, and you can use the opportunity to also refactor. You will know that some of the older code that you work with has some has some could improve from some uh, some uh, refactoring. You write some you write some tests, and you write the code. Uh, you or you refactor the code, right? So this, well, I would take a, a gradual approach and not do a clean, throw everything out and just rewrite everything. No, I would just uh, take the opportunity to, as it touches the old code, write tests, make the fact, make the refactor, and also write tests for the new stuff you're introducing. Yeah, so that would be approach I, that. That's approach I, I made, I had back in when I was working at Make the Tree. So we had to refactor the whole. Login system, but because the login system touches the MySQL, some database in the back end, so I actually, re I actually uh, took the opportunity to refactor some of the old classes. Uh, I also wrote some tests to make sure that 
I didn't bring anything. Right. A test coverage should be a good way of uh, okay, I expect this old, 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 very old class to behave a certain way. Let's write some tests to actually make sure that it's actually supposed to work that way and it is working, working that way. And you make the change and still make sure that it's still giving you that result. Right. So a gradual approach would be, would be what I would advise. Yeah. Yes. Is it going to take a um, longer time um, than normal development? Test driven development is. Um, at the very beginning, when you are not used to TDD, it will definitely be a time sink. Um, setting up your test harness and all the PHP unit, all that stuff, and getting familiarized with the, the way of testing, that's going to result in some downtime in the very beginning. There is no doubt about that. Because as your team familiarize themselves with the ways of testing, the way of the, uh, the way around uh, writing code, and because and there are some code that are so spaghetti and they're so tangled. It takes some time to kind of understand we, where are the um, where are the seams, where are the seams that you can okay. This is the part where we can tear apart and say we can test this part separately as from the other part, right? So five, you know, it's it's going to take a while for the team to ramp up, but once you reach a certain once the team has a certain familiarity in how uh, on how the testing framework works and how best to tear apart the code in, that it makes it testable. Uh, once it, your team has become familiar with that, it will, re it will be much faster. But still, we can assume 20 30 percent times of writing the actual code it will take, even team is experienced yeah, enough. Correct. So, but then think, yeah, well, I used to work at a startup, and you know, then the startups were like, oh, we need this feature yesterday, you know, like, <laughs> dude, if we don't test this, it's going to, if it breaks in the future, it's, it's going to cost you money. Uh, no users for the product basis it's yeah if we are making a product oh, of course <laughs> well again it's a compromise right it's a compromise about how much you want to write how much you want to how much test to write and how much you want to deliver your how fast you want to deliver your product right so um if you have enough QA people to cover your ass then it's fine uh. <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't put my <laughs> i wouldn't put my bet on it uh, in the long run uh. but yeah. yeah usually it's done by QA yeah. So yeah, they also have some selenium kind projects. of thing yeah. to do some. So yeah, QAs. The more advanced QAs will be writing like selenium tests. They would test the integration level layer, right? Th that those tests are invaluable. It helps you. It helps you check regressions and all that other stuff, right? Um, but then they only see the side effects. They don't see how the code is put together and what how how is how. It could, there could be some hidden bugs that you don't know about, you know. So, a bug is, um, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of what's the quote? You need to check the data integrity. You know, you don't see what's in the data. Yeah. You see that okay, if it's working, something happens. But if the data is corrupted, they don't even see that. It's not right. Now. Yeah. This is the kind of stuff that happens after two months of production. Oops, sorry. Yeah. It, I think it's always uh, have a technical debt, but as long as don't make uh, too long yeah. technical debt, that you can just go forward first and then try to uh, refactor the one that you can refactor first. So there's, there's always a technical debt. It's impossible that you can finish all at once. Yeah. So you leave it like that. But uh, make it like, for me, I make it like not more than 30%. That's my technical debt. More than that, I have to finish the 30. If it's 40, I make it 30 again. I make it like that. Yeah. I, I, I think one way you can help would be to use something like a continuous integration server, like say Travis CI or Code Climate. These are two very very nice free tools you can use. So what this uh, what they do what they have is uh, they basically take a code, run some tests, and tells you information about how many how much how much how many percent code coverage, uh, and it also tells you about uh, uh, bad coding practices like too much copy and pasting and too complex uh, and stuff like that. So Code Climate is one thing you could check out. Uh, Travis is one of those ways you can run the tests uh, so everyone can kind of see. Um, uh, yeah, I would suggest putting, putting, uh, spending time, I think putting, putting together your test suite is one thing. Having a way to let everyone in the team uh, have ownership of the code is having uh, is to have like a CI panel that everyone can see that's red or green or something like that. Um, so when test fail, it's like, oh, red alert, 
something's wrong, someone has pushed a broken test. Uh, <laughs> um, it helps your, your team get some ownership of, 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 the, of the process. Um, yeah. Yes. It seems to be that there's a bit of there's a lot of skepticism to do TDD or maybe even to do tests in the first place. When we ask about compared to normal development, I could ask the question: What is normal development? Here? Does that already do tests or no tests at all? Um, so my question is: What would you take as the major selling point to to to, to go for this approach? Uh, to say, let's do tests in the first place. Let's invest this thirty percent more time. To do tests, how would you convince an organization team to go that way? Invest that. I mean, um, it's going to be cheaper to make changes in the future if we actually do tests and do refactoring your code. Uh, okay, test having tests and refactoring your code immediately, uh, like the DDD way of doing things. Uh, having a failing test, passing test, and then refactor immediately is actually very good in the sense that. How many times have you written code that you wrote two months ago? Then QA came to you and said, I have this bug right now. And then you think, oh shit. How did I write the code again? <laughs> what was I thinking when I wrote that code, right? And then you have to spend time getting back all the, con all the contacts that you had, you had two months ago, like, all right, I wrote this line of code because I was thinking about that and this and that. And then I got distracted by this product, uh, this product meeting, and I came back. I forgot about to write that. The times I did done that, it got released the production. Quite embarrassing. Anyway, yeah. So having having tests and being able to refactor immediately gives this means you have immediate feedback about where your code is working, and immediate <coughs> having that um, having the urgency, uh, or, and then being able to, and being able to refactor it on the spot means you still have context about that code, about why it was written that way. One way we, that uh, we can mitigate this or make it easier to write code and test code is to do pair programming, right? Pair programming means two person working on the same uh, piece of code together. Uh, there are different styles of working. One of the styles of working is called the ping pong. Basically, ping, uh, ping, not ping, ping pong, right? So I write the I write the test, you write the code. I write the test, you write the code. Kind of thing. So kind of, so it helps. It helps you have a, some some fun factor in, in writing this. Aha! I read the I written the ultimate test. I I dare you to pass this. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. It you have you have some fun to the coding experience. Um, but it also means that the knowledge about the code is shared amongst two persons. Basically, it improves improves the. It reduces the risk to your company. Basically, if someone goes away or has an accident or fell sick, at least the other person who had worked on the code before as a pair will have contacts and know how to fix the problem. Right? So that's a, a, a good thing with that. And having a test having a pair programming also helps in the sense it has what I call extreme code review. I mean I've sat next to a developer so many times and I've saved his ass because of typos. <laughs> like, dude, you spell it wrongly. Dude, you spell it wrongly. You know, uh, and they, they immediately, oh yeah, the variable was actually this. I, I, I named it the wrong, I gave it the wrong name in the, in the implementation. Sorry that. Extreme code code review helps as well, right? Um, in reducing all these bugs, possible bugs that go out. I, I'm a big advocate of code pair programming. Uh, so if you can, please do it. I will encourage you to try it, um, and having that, and it makes it easier to help, because right then the, the burden of writing tests is shared between two person, right, and uh, you know, and then basically you can focus like say you do you use a ping pong kind of uh, method, so one person will be focusing on how to structure the test, how to prepare the test in a way that you know think think about think about the fixtures that could be required and needed for this piece of code, and the other person will just focus on how to write the code in the most performant way, and how to write the code in the way that would be, you know, that you can easily uh, make changes in the future, right? So, I, I'm a big advocate of pair programming. If you can afford it, if the company can afford it, please try it. Yeah. Oh, QA is <laughs> Actually, in a way, QA can also be your, your pair. 
I, 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 <coughs> anyone, a designer could be your pair, a uh, QA could be your pair, a product manager could be your pair. This could be a way of helping them understand what you're doing, right? So that's one way to try to um, um, have a more shared responsibility among the team and have a shared ownership uh, for everyone. I hope I, I hope this, this makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I can be reached at Kodo Kung Fu on Twitter. You can you have a question, you can tweet me or and Facebook message me or something. Um, actually that's all I have. Thank you.